Hello everybody and welcome to the Top Producer Show. So my name is Brandy and this is Jeff and the whole point of this show is to show you guys what it actually takes to become a top producer in network marketing. Now a lot of the methods that we use we do use in traditional business as well so if you own a different business you might want to stay tuned. Right now we're going over the book Atomic Habits by James Clear. And I think this is the last chapter today. He has a bunch of stuff in the back of the book too, so I'll go through that and we'll see if it's something that we want to go on the next go through on the next uh, show that we do on Monday. But uh, if not, we will be on our next book. And stay tuned because we will be letting you know at the end of the show which book we're going to be going over next. But anywho, the final chapter, chapter twenty, the downside of creating good habits. So habits create the foundation of mastery. And when you know simple movements so well that you can perform them without thinking, you're free to pay attention to more advanced details. However, once you get to the, that point, um, Gary Vander Chuck talks about don't fall in love with one way to market. Um, everything is always changing around us. The world is always changing. And if you don't change with it, um, you're gonna get stuck in the back so sometimes you do have to, you have to be reviewing and looking around enough to know when something's about to change like you have to change your process like at one point we all would call people like telemarketers everybody used to do calls and people would pick up the phone but now if I were to try to call my mother-in-law right now she would not pick up a phone and now she'll send me a text and be like what do you need people don't pick up their phone anymore which is why years ago, Jeff created the text messaging system because that's the fastest way to get people to respond. And we had to change because everybody around us were changing and we have to do that for our traditional business as well. When we're hiring for a holistic health practice, uh, we don't call people. And we hear this from multiple different business owners where they're like, man, I'm just struggling to hire people. Like nobody's getting back to me. And we would ask like, well, how are you reaching out to them? We're like, well, we call and I call again. Oh, and they email. And they email. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's the problem. I'm like, everybody is doing everything over text now. And people want to know what it is before they even get on the phone and commit their time to even seeing what the heck is going on, which is why that's why we text them to see if they're even interested, send them an overview of who we're looking for and what we do. And then we schedule a phone call with them and then run through the process. And that process is so much easier because not only does it fit more with what people are doing now and like culturally, it fits more with you know, how people are right now, but also you tend to not waste time with people because if you look back, I've done the phone calls and <laughs> they kind of suck <laughs> just a little bit because they're so intimidating to do. The texting is a lot easier and it's not as nerve wracking, but you don't waste as much time with somebody who is not interested. They're able to look over the overview and be like, hey, you know what, this isn't for me. And it's like, okay, cool, no problem. And then you can move on. But once you master that skill, you have to look at like, okay, is there a better way to do this? And then you can get into the part where you can start tinkering with your process a little bit just to see if something wor it works better. But it's important that when you first start and when you're brand new, you need to follow the process exactly because you don't know enough or you don't have enough experience yet to be able to make those decisions of like, okay, is this gonna work better? Or is this gonna work better? And plus when you first get started, you wanna create the foundation first. Like you wanna uh, get to the point where you have a steady enough paycheck coming in and you could show that you know what you're doing before you start changing it because otherwise people get into this habit where they're just like, oh, I need to change this, this, and this. And it's usually not because you need to change it, it's just because people don't like it. Like we've had people change the system multiple times or the script that we go off of for text message. And we've had it done in network marketing, we've had it done at our holistic health practice and it's always because they're like, I just don't like how that's worded. I don't like that this presentation is so long. And I'm like, it's that's not the point. It's not about what you like, it's about what works. Also. We have 
the presentation and the text message all set up for each one of the personality types. So we're hitting each one of the four personalities when we send this out. So it actually attracts a broader group of people because you may be a personality type where you're only a small percentage of the population and then you're missing everybody else. So that's pretty much what this chapter was about was just don't once you master something make sure that you don't just get stuck in the one habit you want to make sure that you leave room for improvement so you want to uh, plan do review look over what you're doing see is there a better way to do it so that way you don't just get stuck in a rut of doing the same thing but then never changing at any point to improve so that's what i got from this chapter and back kitty are you helping? I guess so. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to turn this over to you. And what was your takeaways from this chapter? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is, is I mean, he's right. You Once you master something, you will get bored. Then you start looking at different things. Chris, what's up? Ellen, how's it going? Um, you'll get bored, right? You get bored of doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, especially if you get good at it, especially if you're driven. And then what? Then... You guys are in trouble. Don't bite me. Oh. <laughs> hey, you hooked me. No. Oh, my. So, what I learned from one of the guys that I was taught by, David Bird, is he said, look, you're going to get bored. You're going to get, you know, distracted. The, the, the shiny ball is always out there. There's always something new and flashy. So, to be able to stay on track, you need to track. I mean, it kind of makes a lot of sense. He goes, if you look at any Olympic athlete, right, if you look at any um, professional in any type of sports at all, whether it's bodybuilding or baseball or hockey or, you know, track and field or boxing, they track everything. They track the water. They track the food. They track the workout. They track your heart rate. They're doing blood tests. All of that happens all the time with professionals. You know what amateurs do? They guess, hey, how many presentations did you do? Oh, I don't know, about three or four or five, I don't know. How many contacts did you make? I don't know. You know, I took yesterday off, I felt bad, this, that, and that. I mean, you can tell the difference between a professional and an amateur in 10 seconds asking two questions. That's all it takes. So if you want to move forward, if you want to give somebody a plan, you have to stay on track first, but that's why tracking is so good because I can then come out and say, look, I work 90 minutes. This is how many people I contacted. This is how many people asked for the presentation. This is how many people asked for the video. This is how many, you know, people I got on the phone with, and this is how many people closed out of a month of doing it. Now people are running off of actual numbers, not, Hey, I'm really excited about this. Oh, well, that's, that's great. Um, you know, that might mean you have more influence than somebody that might mean you had better contacts than somebody that might mean, you know, you're in a different market than somebody, but when you can do it consistently month after month, after month, after month, after month, after month, year after year, that's when you know, you have a system that you can pass off to somebody else. That's how you can duplicate astronomically faster. Um, and the other thing is, is you can hold people longer, meaning um, people then drift off when they're not getting the results you're getting because you don't have an actual plan. You're just winging it because you're good. Um, and I was one of those people. I figured it out and I was good at it and I was winging it and, you know, every day. And then when I started tracking it, um, like my mentor, one of my mentors, um, you know, a professional coach that we hired said, look, you've got to track this. You've got to know where you're at. Then you don't get as bored because you incrementally are always pushing that number further and further. If you did 15 presentations, next month you're going for 20. If you did 20 presentations, next month you're going for 25. Until you hit that unbelievable peak, then you kind of move down to the next number and say, okay, well, I'm doing all this contacting. How do I get more presentations. How do I get more results? How do I start recruiting more people? Because you master the first thing and you keep pushing it up, then you can master the second thing and push the number up. Then you can master the third thing and push the number up. Pretty soon your results can go through the roof. 
And, you know, that's how I went from recruiting one person to recruiting over 10 people a month. And I could do it consistently, right? And then you're bringing in enough where everybody else is like, oh my gosh, this is easy. That's how you create momentum. And once you have momentum, um, John Maxwell says momentum is the great exaggerator. The great exaggerator. Once you get momentum, the whole key is to get momentum. Because in momentum, everything is easier. The worst person performs at a higher level. So that's kind of the ultimate goal of creating all these habits is what I learned was finding the right things to do. How do you find the right things to do? Well, you find the right things to do by finding people who are already doing it at a very high level and then asking them questions and writing down every single step. Most of the people who are masters at stuff forget that they're talking to somebody who doesn't know anything. And you hear it all the time in seminars. Oh, I just got excited and I called a bunch of people. I'm sure there was more to it than that. So what I've done is been intent at asking the questions of, you know, you did lead. Where did the leads come from? Were they telephone leads? Were they this guy? What kind of leads were they? And then I got that part. And I was like, well, what was your contact back then? Oh, I just sent him a video. Really? There were no videos when you got started. So how the f did you send a video when the videos didn't come out for five years. Like I know when the video came out, you're giving me the date you got in. There's a five year gap there. So what the hell were you doing? Those are the kind of questions that I ask. Maybe not that strong, but like sometimes I've been that strong with even huge leaders because I'm like, you're not telling us the truth because you're trying to sell what you're doing now because you're making money off of the tools or the website or the magazines or the DVDs or whatever the hell you're trying to sell. I'm trying to find out what were you doing back here. And what's funny is, is once I find that out, it's very similar in almost every case. Um, you know, what was the contact you were using? And they would tell me what the contact was. And I was like, okay, that's really good. That would probably still work today. Then, you know, well, what were you, you know, what presentation were you given? Oh, no, I sent everybody, you know, I, I sent everybody to this and this. Well, that's cool, but those weren't set up yet, right? I, I know the dates when certain things come out. That's one of the things I'll do is I'll research. When did the videos come out? When did the DVDs come out? When did the magazines come out? When did this? You started years before that. So what the fuck were you doing? And then I get that information and slowly you start piecing together what people did. What I want to know is what did you do to get to this level? Not what you're doing now, right? That's different because there's a different activity that it takes to get to that point. Once you get to that point, meaning once you have 3,000, 5,000 people on a team, your role in that team shifts. You go from being a massive person producer to a massive teacher. It's basically, you know, 99-1, meaning 99% of your time in the beginning is basically going out and recruiting and building that momentum and, and basically bringing people on because you're losing people just as fast as you bring them on. Because it's going to take, watch this, it's going to take a few years to sift through all the people to find a couple good ones. Then once you have a couple good ones and you start teaching them, then all of a sudden you have a ton of new people on your team and you need to know what to do and how to, which is funny because we're going to go into our team building event this next month and that's what it talks about. Once you start, once you master recruiting and you can bring people onto the team, now you've got people, what are you doing with them? What are you saying to them? How are you training them? Do you understand the personalities, et cetera, et cetera? So it's really this tracking sheet of, you mastered something, now you got to turn around and teach it. That's a higher level of the same game, right? It's really the same thing, only it's a completely different set of skills. You had to learn it based on your personality. Now you're having to teach it to four different personalities. That's a different skill. So that's what we got. Um, the reason um, why we put together my leadership network is because I got so many questions from people who are in the industry about how we were able to put it together and then put it together again and then go somewhere else and put it together again. Um, and we consistently have made money in everything we do and we're able to build teams and have people involved. And, you know, um, what's great is, is obviously it's worked because some of the original teams we built I still have people who are totally committed to the original teams I built 
meaning they're still showing up. They're still at everything. I see their pictures online. I see how committed they are. They're still working. I'm not even, I, one, of the, one of the companies and organizations, I haven't been in that company for, in, in, in that organization for 11 or 12 years. It's still going without me. Like that, that's where you can create some money. I mean, yeah, I wish I was still getting paid off of it, but you know, different, different things for different people. I needed to move on to something else. Thank goodness I did because I learned all this other information. Now, if I want to go anywhere, I'm able to build faster. I'm able to build easier. I'm able to teach what I'm doing, you know, and that's, that's part of the reason why it works. So that's what we got. If you want information like that, go over to uh, join my leadership network. Um, go underneath the video, click join now, join the community, and we'll talk. Brandy? All right. Well, that is it for today. And the next book that we are going to be going over is, sorry, I have a cat who has my other hand, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. So that is going to be the next book that we are going to go over. And we are here Monday through Friday at noon. So you guys will see us on Monday. It is Friday. Have a good weekend. And we will see you guys then.